good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, Tim Jaboyk, I'm the planning director for the city of Richmond. Um, so I just want to start out and, and discuss why we need code refresh. See if I can better code. Um, you know, I've said a few times, provisions and return 1976 orbits uh, prohibit a lot of development that aligns with current realities, uh, economic conditions, social preferences. Um, also, you know, get 62 and a half square miles, and we should use them as effectively and efficiently as possible. Uh, we're also in a national housing crisis uh, where many people cannot find or afford a place to live in our city. Uh, and then we also have a troubling, and uh, unfortunately often untold, history of using exclusionary zoning uh, to further segregation in our city, uh, which has resulted in great disparities among our residents. Uh, Richmond is, I'll say, a tale of two cities uh, in and of itself. Uh, we have great disparities among a lot of our residents. Uh, disparities in educational attainment, employment status, household income, uh, and also physical and mental health. Two residents growing up in Richmond, even if separated by just a few blocks, can have drastically different life paths and outcomes. These results are just as much um, a product of our social systems as they are a built environment. A built environment that is shaped, regulated, by our zoning code. So, when we talk about zoning, when we talk about our code, um, these are things that regulate questions that you know, many of us ask. What options do you have for finding a place to live? How close is the nearest daycare, school, park, or grocery store? And what modes of transportation can you use to travel there quickly and safely? And also ask, how close is the nearest junkyard, refinery, expressway, or vape shop? So, where do we go from here? Uh, I think uh, it's important to talk about it. We need to talk about it. Uh, that's why we're here tonight. Uh, we're committed to having those conversations, and I'm very excited to have a great group of panelists uh, here with us this evening uh, to go through and have a discussion and hopefully answer some of your questions here this evening. Uh, so with that, uh, again, thank you for being here tonight, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, A.P. Pena. Director 
a non at this nonprofit focused on creating greater access to housing opportunities through policy, research, and collaboration. And next to me is Mitchell Silver. He's a principal with McAdams, a land planning and design company. He's an award-winning planner with more than 39 years of experience and is internationally recognized for his leadership and contributions to contemporary planning issues. And you can read more about our panelists uh, on the cheat sheet outside later. Um, before we jump into some of the specific questions, um, one thing that I wish happened more often when I attend forums is somebody tell me what they want me to remember when I leave and forget some of the early stuff. So starting with you, Jason, what is what is one thing that you hope the folks that are in this room tonight take away with them? Uh, thanks. Just one quick real quick, James. <laughs> James, I'm sorry. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I, as was noted a second ago, uh, City of Charlottesville completed its zoning rewrite back in December of last year, uh, adopted by our city council. So I just want to say I'm thrilled to see another one of Virginia's great cities going into this process of rewriting their zoning ordinance uh, for all the reasons that uh, Kevin outlined earlier. Uh, zoning is an important aspect of uh, how your city develops, uh, but it's also important to remember that it's not the only determinant of what happens it, with development and, develop, and, and uh, building in the city. It's just one factor. Uh, so when you pass a new zoning ordinance and it identifies areas for new development, you know, new heights or new densities of development, all that is is a body of regulation. It's not really, it's not a plan, it's not a, it's not a program for development, it is a body of regulation that suggests what can be done with a piece of property. But there's all these other factors, including what, have, what, what the conditions are of the land, what the financing, what the economy looks like at any given moment. So the point really that I'm trying to make is, is that what happens with development coming forward is going to happen over time and over a very long period of time. I'd be willing to bet at this point that Richmond's current zoning ordinance is not built out. And I wouldn't expect your new ordinance to be built out in any any point in the near future either. So. John? Thank you. Um, maybe we should coordinate, coordinate these a little bit. So uh, I think for me, it's, it's a little similar, is that um, there is no silver bullet in the housing space. So zoning is, is no exception. Um, zoning reform is not going to bring about on its own housing affordability. Uh, it, it just, it's not a direct correlation in the absence of additional funding, as, uh, incentives, and as he said, an economic environment that is conducive to development. So you have to have the zoning in place to provide the legal framework, and then you also have to have incentives to make the numbers work. You have to have uh, additional funding. You have to have policy, and when you have all of those together, I think that's when you get the most complementary system for affordable housing. So. Um, that's what I hope you all take away. This is a key part of the puzzle, but it's not the only piece. Uh, but it's great that the city is addressing this. Good evening, everyone. Mitchell Silver went through a similar experience in Raleigh, North Carolina. Had about a 50-year-old code, and we updated it, and it was approved in 2012. What I would say is that zoning of the rules, the rules allow you to build the height, the bulk, the setbacks, the parking, the lot size, the use is basically the rules. And one thing I want to share with you is if you want to have a successful code, make the rules easy for what you want to see. I was in North Carolina and the council said, we want to have mixed use development in our downtown. And we want to have more residential. I said, no you don't because your rules make it hard to do what you want. If you truly want to have good, walkable development, then change your rules and make it easier to do. And make it hard to do for what you don't want to see. So typically you have a plan, that's the policy, that's the vision, that's the values, and then you code for those vision and values, but it's about the rules. And I'll probably say this at the end, 
but make it easy for the things that you want to see while you're creating these worlds. So that's the one upfront takeaway I'll share with you, and then we'll see what happens in this conversation. I may offer some advice at the end. You pretty much answered my first question, but I'm gonna give you a chance in case you wanna answer it differently. What's your bumper sticker version of zoning? It's not your your opening line sounded like it's zoning is the rules, but is that what you, do you have a different bumper sticker or is that what you would go with? It's it's rules to build a great city. Javon, what's what's a bumper sticker definition of, of zoning or zoning's connection to housing for you? Um I mean, I think that's the way to review it, is that zoning is the law, land use is, is what you desire to do, and, and zoning governs um, how you desire to do these things. So can you align your policy with your zoning? Um, in most cases, they're gonna be in your room. You're gonna have policies that try to come before the zoning, and then you have to go and figure out how you can address the zoning. And I think if you have a reliable zoning code, and you have reliable and predictable policies, that's gonna make you a much more desirable uh, city or county or jurisdiction to do development. Jake, you just went through your public process, so you probably had, you probably made bumper stickers for what the is. is. No, our, our assignments were different, but I can't, I can't think what you're suggesting about that. That's, that's awesome. Um, let's, so as, by way of context, instead of just specific cities where you've been, uh, Anybody that's gone through planning school or worked as a planner has learned about the history of zoning. Um, Director Vaughn talked, touched on it a bit. How would you, who, whoever wants to chime in first, how would you summarize zoning's legacy in the United States? Since I teach a course on planning um, at UNC Chapel Hill, let me just take a stab at this. Zoning is interesting, came out of the private sector, was a chamber of commerce that pushed the zoning. As we went from an agricultural economy to industrial and people moved to cities and housing had to be near where people worked, there was massive density. New York City, 100,000 people lived in one square mile. And before zoning, people basically had covenants and prevented blacks and Jews from living in housing, or they sued one another because they had residential and someone built a noxious use next door. And they said, we have to have a better way of organizing all this development because of the noise, the dust, uh, the fire hazard, lack of light. And so they came up with this approach to let's come up with rules about how we're going to build and the 1926 enabling legislation passed by Congress set forth a way that all states could come up with the rules to govern how they built. That was the beginning of it, and that New York City being the first with the 1916 zoning resolution or ordinance really kicked off a national movement, and by the 1950s, almost every state in the U.S. adopted zoning as a way of organizing land uses and giving some predictability and patterns and rules about how you can develop. So you couldn't have an industrial plant next to residential uses, there was a separation. So that was the evolution of zoning and really the turn of the 20th century and it's been with us ever since. And I can don't get into all the lawsuits and the court cases over time they kind of fine tune what zoning should or should not do. But basically it was a way, as places developed and urbanized, it was the rules to make sure it protected the public health, safety, and welfare, which is in the preface of every zoning code on the planet, at least in the US. James, you look like you're thinking about adding on to that a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I am in the sense that I think that is a very good, very good summary. The, the legacy, if you think about what else zoning has, has, has done, is it, it has given us a tool, it's given cities and, and communities a tool to organize the development of that city over time. Right? If you think back even further to the planned communities of early America, of, of, uh, of different places in Europe, um, they had different tools, but they were arriving at the same 
conclusion. How are we going to lay out our streets? How are we going to allocate land for development of different necessary land uses? And zoning has given us a, as a tool set for doing that. Um, but also, as we think about the legacy of zoning, we think about where that toolkit has gone too far. Um, it's gone too far in terms of separating uses. What's a good idea to prevent nuisances uh, arising by, by protecting quality of life uh, and the environment for uh, residents, but going too far and separating those uses out and making it uh, absolutely a requirement that everyone must drive between uses, drive between their homes, drive to achieve shopping um, uh, opportunities. And even when you look overseas at other community, other, other countries that have zoning, Germany was a lot of our model for how we pursued zoning came out of Germany in the early part of the 1900s. Uh, but if you look at their zoning ordinances today, when they have a residential district, residential automatically includes commercial uses. Because from, from their perspective, how do you have a place where people live that don't also, doesn't also allow for small stores, shops, and the necessary day-to-day -day commercial uses that people need? We've, we've, we've pursued a very strict separation, not, not common for us to want to add, I don't know if Jamal wants to add, but in the ability to zone, states enable municipalities like Richmond police power. And that police power is a very heavy word. It gave them ability to actually start to dictate what type of uses and intensity can go on every property. People challenge it and you're taking away my development rights is in a taking, but the courts have upheld that municipalities have the police power to organize the development within their jurisdiction. And that's something you should also be aware of. A plan is about the policies, but the code is about the law, the police power to organize uh, municipalities. And that's a key to understand. So when I think about, and, and was thinking about this question in terms of how would we describe uh, zoning and its legacy, first I think about uh, it's really a reflection of the communities that we see around us today in terms of a lot of disparities that we have in, in different communities, uh, particularly along the lines of race. And so it's been used as a very powerful tool in the past um, to ensure that certain communities aren't with other communities. And I think you can look at, you know, Richmond's history in particular, the city council decision made, I believe, in the 1910s, um, you know, in accordance with Virginia's you know, laws around interracial marriage and not allowing, you know, folks to, to live on the same block if you couldn't marry, some, marry someone who was of the majority race and other things. Um, and that also bleeds into things like school segregation and the makeup of our schools still to this day. Uh, I'll do a quick plug of a report that will be coming out in just a few weeks by VCU and, and University of Richmond and my organization and a few others uh, about the impact of zoning on our school systems and uh, educational attainment and other uh, performance measures within our public schools across the region and the impact that it's still having. So that's kind of commemorating 50 years since, uh, or rather, the anniversary of Brown v. Board. And so that report will be out in the next few weeks. But I think, when you think about the legacy of zoning, um, as with many laws in this country, you have to think about how that impacted the way that our communities look today. But also as an opportunity to use that tool to create greater opportunity um, throughout all of our communities and, and jurisdictions where there hasn't been, particularly in the case of housing. So when you're talking about this legacy of organized blobs, planned blobs, where it's like, the living zone, the eating zone, and some se separated by class, historically separated by race, but then also type of land use. Um, a lot of cities and counties across the country are going through this kind of process now where they're revising their zoning code. Would you, is it the kind of thing that zoning itself, is it a failed experiment, or is it, uh, it just is decade after decade used in the wrong way to force these things to be separate and then, like James said, to force everything into driving zones so that to get from the eating zone to the learning zone, you have to get in the car. There's no question that the, well, the answer to the question is cities evolve, places evolve, new technologies evolve, and there's no question the introduction of the automobile changed the entire landscape of our country. 
You go to Europe, that was a city not built on cars, it was built on horses and walking and horse carriages, and you see that development pattern is very different. And so there's no question that the highway did change our pattern of development, and so you started to see a suburban type of development emerge with more single family that was drivable, so there's, not, there's no question about it. But now we've evolved. People now return to cities, they want more walkable places, some people don't want to drive, and zoning has to catch up. Mixed use development. When I was a planner, there was something called daycare center. And I'm sure if 1976, the last time you did a zoning code, that did not exist in your code. So you had to do a patch. Then there were these gyms or these health facilities where we all go to, Planet Fitness, but those didn't exist. They emerged. And we had to figure out how do we put that in our code. And so the point I'm making is that you always want to make, make sure your plan is up to date and current. Even housing types that people are developing is different. There's a lot more mixed use type projects. The question is, are you going to patchwork your code over time or are you going to do a total rewrite? So I applaud you, Richmond, for doing a, a rewrite. Otherwise, it's going to be patched all over. But I wouldn't say it's a failed experiment. I think it was a good starting point. But it's up to us to make sure the code responds to the changing needs and patterns of how people live today. And that's what the journey you're about to embark on. So one of the things that uh, it's certainly making headlines, I don't know if it's the most talked about part of zoning updates, but uh, housing, and especially affordable housing and missing middle housing. Our neighbors to the north, Alexandria and Arlington, are dealing with lawsuits of different types. Um, but one of the things that terrifies people about zoning at all, especially when someone starts talking about reforming zoning code, is does that mean a different type of house is going to be allowed? Um, and then one of the, my favorite catchphrases that have uh, come up recently is abundant housing. Because uh, it's just a positive spin on all this. It's rather than uh, a negative angle on different types of, of housing, it's just, wouldn't it be great to have all types of homes, small homes, big homes, I mean, Goldilocks homes, small lots, big lots, everything in between. So what does abundant housing mean to you all? Um, I'll, I'll just I'll start there, because that's a, that's a wide open question. But Javon, what does abundant housing mean to you? It's a good question. Um, I think typically when people use the term, they're referring to having diversified housing stock. Um, it does our zoning allow for that. So not your traditional single family home with a large 15,000 uh, square foot lot, but do you allow for um, lower lot sizes? Do you allow for greater density in neighborhoods where that usually uh, isn't the case? Do you allow for duplexes or triplexes? And things that would enable someone who, I don't know, is that 60% of the area being income to, to live in the same area that someone who's well over 120% of the area being income. Um, can you have different occupations in the same neighborhood? Can you have people that maybe require uh, public transportation on a daily basis, living in the same vicinity as someone who is going to be um, using their car every day? So I think that's typically what I think of in abundant housing. And the other thing I just want to speak to the, the, the fear that is, is surrounding this issue and some of the lawsuits in other jurisdictions across the state or in, and across the country. I think the fear of change, the fear of things that are different and new is usually going to be the largest impediment uh, to progress in the space of housing. And you know, when I think about just demystifying this issue around zoning, um, I live in a home that is on an 8,000 square foot lot. And Currently, with the zona code and the jurisdiction that I live, you couldn't build that today. Uh, the minimum square foot for a lot is 12,000 square feet. That is, just to put it in perspective, equivalent to two and a half NBA basketball courts. Uh, it's a pretty big lot. And so you can't build anything, single family, that's smaller than that. Uh, a lot of the units and homes that people live in today would not be legal with a lot of zoning codes that are in place. Um, and so I think it's just recognizing that they're fearful of things that already exist. Uh, they're fearful of change. And oftentimes, I think if we can do a better job of socializing this issue, providing greater education, and having these kinds of conversations, uh, we can hopefully lower that you know, guard of folks that are a little nervous about change, a little nervous about having different housing types and neighborhoods, because quite honestly, we're just asking for 
of what's already been here in many cases. When, when uh, you know, directly on the question, when I when I think of abundant housing, I think about housing choice and I think about opportunity. Um, the, when, when zoning locks up the the range of housing choices available within a community or within a neighborhood, they reduce that. They, they reduce opportunity. They re reduce the ability for people to make uh, choices with their homes, with their lifestyles, that uh, will allow those people ultimately to prosper. So I think of small examples, like when I had young children, I lived in Fort Smith, Virginia. Uh, we had a small starter home, um, two, two houses down from us. My mother-in-law was able to live in an apartment, uh, in a small apartment, in a very, very small apartment building. That gave us incredible opportunity for frankly, free childcare, right? Those opportunities are kind of an essential aspect of how people can have a uh, choice and ultimately experience uh, you know, a ladder of success, prosperity. Um, yeah, and, and then thinking about the things that people can do when you, when you open up the opportunity for a small uh, accessory apartment in your home. Create a source of income, but also create an opportunity for somebody else to live in a more affordable location than you I would agree uh, with both James and Javon. To me, abundant housing is about housing choices. But I want to say something, don't know if it's controversial, but we're here to have a conversation. I separate housing from affordable housing. Housing is housing. To make it affordable means it has some subsidy, unless it's a tiny home or a mobile home, to make it affordable. It's the same housing. So it's how do we increase housing production, but then how do you subsidize it to make it affordable? When people hear affordable, they think of income. And so if I ask people in this room to raise, who ever rented in their life in this room, please raise your hand. Okay, please somebody take a picture. Now, but when we think about a rental product coming in, different emotions conjure up. Because we own property and we have our life equity into it, any sign of danger or undermining that equity, it could be renters, you know, they're not as American as homeowners, and I say renters pay taxes, they pay through their rent. And they have the same say, there are some they can't afford to buy a home. Veterans, seniors, new professionals, working families. We want to provide abundant housing for all people so that we could all live here, but far too often, hearing the word affordable housing is human nature. It defaults to, I'm not sure what that is. I need to protect my property values, the equity if I invested in my home. And so you get uncomfortable conversations. Housing is housing. You can have a high rise that is market rate, but if you subsidize the units to make sure you meet certain targets, it's now affordable. We can have a 12, not 12,000. A 2,000 square foot house that's built. It could be market rate, or if you subsidize it, it becomes affordable. Sometimes we say we have to build affordable housing, which means we want to build subsidized housing because in order to build a unit, what, 250 to 300,000 for affordable unit, you can't sell it for 150 unless it's subsidized. So I want to make sure we distinguish between the two. And far too often we say we want to put in affordable housing, it starts to trigger. You need housing for all. And they can go from an apartment, just like you, to a home, to a larger home. That's how you create a great place, a great community. And your zoning should allow that spectrum from single family to missing middle to multifamily so that you can have a place where everyone lives. So when these students from BC graduate, they can actually get educated here, but invest and live in this community and help make it great. So speaking of choice, um, I was checking the time. We, since we're not going to be able to talk two hours for housing, um, I'll take take it to one of my happy places with choice, mobility choice. So any anybody that's been in Richmond for more than five minutes knows that we've got great bones to have the potential for car light to living. You can still own a car, but have the ability to walk to a bunch of places. We walk to dinner tonight. There, there's loads within a walking, biking distance. Or if you think of the bus as an express sidewalk, even better um, reach. 
So in what ways can our zoning code, how have you seen this work in other places where a zoning code can help liberate us from car dependency, where we don't have to drive to everything all the time? I just thought I had a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, 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 first, the first answer there is proximity, right? Where, where different uses are close enough together that people have the choice of walking, have the choice of bicycling, Choice that transportation systems are absolutely dependent on choice. When we when we talk about the challenge of congestion, when we talk about transportation challenges generally, those are driven by a lack of choice. If everybody has to get up in the morning and get on the same highway, then yeah, everybody is stuck in traffic. But if there are multiple routes that one can take, if there are multiple modes of transportation available, then there is choice and people can find the solution that works best for them to get to their destination. But when things are in proximity, you open up the choice of walking away. So I have to give a shout out to Colin, hey Colin, from uh, Code Studio. So in, in Raleigh, we came up with a plan. We wanted to make sure we created walkable environments and throughout our city, we created a polycentric approach. We identified eight growth centers in our city and 12 multimodal corridors intentionally. And then we zoned for it. We had these aged out shopping centers, strip mall. Guess what? Let's put zoning around all the shopping centers to go vertical at seven stories. And when it got built, it became a walkable community. People said, no, traffic, traffic, no. That project captured all the tricks because people now walked across the street to the shopping center for restaurants and the supermarket. And we repeated it again and again. The way you do this is by creating those mixed use environments throughout the city where people don't have to walk. Parking could be a pain. I would love the fact that we create these more places. I was driving down Broad Street, look at all these low rise buildings and saying, wow, you can go 10, 20 stories. And all of a sudden, there's limited traffic because now people can walk to the uses versus getting in their car and driving. I was in another neighborhood right near Carytown, very solid residential neighborhood, and then there was uh, East Cary Street, Carrotown, where you're gonna have to drive there. So my whole point is, mixed use development works as you look at your code. Where can those centers and corridors be where you can urbanize, handle your growth, have a multi-mobile corridor for biking, for walking, and buses, and it reduces traffic congestion, and it creates a lot more livable place. The place I mentioned in the Village District in Raleigh, seniors love it. They don't have to live out in the outskirts at a senior center and get busted on a van to go shopping, they literally walk out the door, go for a walk, and some of you go to a mall and just walk around in circles. I don't know what they do anymore. Thinking of mixed use walkable, you can build it in by the places you create, not the entire city, but figure out those growth centers, urbanize it, and then the magic happens. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I, uh, when I think about this, I, I think of the study VCU did six or seven years ago uh, that showed the housing and jobs imbalance in the region that showed where many of the low wage earning jobs were located and then where most of the individuals who would be working in those jobs where they lived. And it was a significant gap. And obviously transportation wasn't uh, the level it is today to facilitate those folks to those jobs. And found that around one in 10 people who, for example, uh, worked in Shore Pump actually lived in Shore Pump. And so we're thinking about how do we have uh, a more efficient re region? It's not going to be through more sprawl. Uh, it's an incredibly inefficient use of resources. You have to get comfortable with density, and you have to get comfortable with things like proximity, uh, and enable things that we're talking about. So like if you have seniors who are in fixed incomes, and maybe owning a home is not the best option for them anymore, and they have uh, opportunities to live in housing where they have access to groceries at walking distance, where they have access uh, to medical care, uh, those are the kind of communities that we want to build and not, not pockets of isolation. So it will facilitate a lot of things. Traffic congestion will, will, will be, re be reduced, obviously, but also enabling people to live near where they work. Um, and I think just the communities that ultimately most people want to live in. So in any community, you're going to have, you threw out the word density. So of course, any planner knows in the wrong room, density is going to light somebody's hair on fire, just a word. Uh, it's, it's a vague kind of thing. I like that you mentioned specific numbers. Um, so some places, 
you're going to have a guest come to town and say, maybe 10 stories, I don't believe it. Somebody else is going to come and say, why not 30 stories or 50 stories? Like, if it's mixed use, can you go up? And if you go up, how high do you go up? So in any of these kinds of conversations, you're going to have people, especially Richmond is no exception, where we have a lot of people, um, I'm one of these people who didn't, I wasn't born here, but they'll come from other areas that were lower density, sprawled out development, and they come for the great stuff that Richmond has to offer. But then once they're here, and you start talking about a mixture of uses, compact development, things that go high up in the air, uh, you get a crowd that says, we need to preserve the neighborhood character. So, oh, character preservation is may or may not be. So, can I respond to these? Well, people? first, I have a, so I do public facilitation. We had a whole session on what is community character and neighborhood character. Nobody could explain it. It was a feeling, it's something you see. How do you cope with that? And so, very often, and I remember there were folks in the black community saying, oh, yeah. Neighborhood character, that's the term that's used to deny all the projects that will make us move to the next level. It is a scary word, uh, and it's hard to code for. If you're a Stark district, easy. Outside of a Stark district, unless you look at form and setback, to me it's very tricky to capture. If you're gonna code for it, you have the team that'll help you do it. I wanna say something just about density in this conversation, because I heard through public engagement, five or 10. So you know, so you understand, if you start to go to 10, it's really not worth it to develop. There's something called stick built. You see it happening right now. They build on a concrete podium and that is all built of wood. Once you go over seven stories, you go to high rise construction. Because of the fire code, you have to transition to concrete. It's not worth it to go to 10. It's cheaper to go to 20. And so when you hear 10, it may sound and feel like, okay, that's about the right number, but 20 is when you're gonna to start to say, okay, now the project can work. We can get the apartments, we can get the activity to make the project work. So please take that in consideration. I'm sure the consultants will give you a lot more, but you can say 10, you're not gonna get a lot of 10. So that's something you should certainly uh, uh, consider. Secondly, the higher you go, the more taxable value you get for that property, which means all you homeowners, your taxes remain low or stable. So that's the other benefit of putting density in the right places, not everywhere, but to capture this term community character is very elusive because the code is about public health, safety, and welfare. It's almost silent on aesthetics and design, and that's very often what people want to see. They want to customize what it looks like to reflect neighborhood character. So I'll just put that out there to see if my other colleagues want to wait. Just on the, on the notion of community character as well, like beyond the sense of aesthetics, I, I've often heard talk, people talk about community character in terms of the people who live there, the community, uh, the, the people who make up that community. Um, and But one of the things to recognize is cities are always evolving. Right? The buildings evolve over time, maybe even over a long period of time. The people who live there evolve. But when we lock in what's allowed to be built, we lock in the density that can be built, we are all but guaranteeing that over time, as if the desirability of the community is there, the costs are gonna go up and the actual nature of the community will change. The people who live there will change. That's called gentrification, it's called displacement. I, it's happening very powerfully in Charlottesville, that was one of the drivers for our uh, uh, rewrite of our zoning ordinance. Gentrification in Charlottesville is one of the reasons we have up the density allowed so that we can create opportunities for new housing types that allow for a mixture and a diverse population, uh, particularly on economic scales. So, uh, so when we talk about community character and protecting it, recognize that these places are always evolving. And the decisions we make now may have unintended consequences relative to that community character. So speaking of evolving and, and flexibility, um, can you explain, maybe each of you, if, if you want to chime in for this, explain form-based code and what we might learn from it or apply from it? Uh, form-based codes or form-based hybrids are the latest innovation about how to communicate what you want built. Some places will say 
uh, you have an FAR of four. How many people know what an FAR is? This is a very sophisticated group. Not the average citizen. Does everybody know what a four-story building looks like? Or a two-story building? That's what form based is. It's about the form. And usually a form based said, okay, in this location, you can go up to seven stories. And this location is two stories. It focuses on the form of the building versus all these different rules to get predictability and flexibility about what you'd like to see. The other unique thing about form-based is that rather than having very prescriptive rules about residential mixed use, it just says residential mixed use. And you determine the mix you want. Two stories could be retail, two stories can be residential. It's your choice, or one story. It allows that flexibility, so it's more based on form than on all the other rules that are in what we call a traditional code. And so that's kind of the innovation. It's easier to plan and to figure out and for people to visualize, and it provides more certainty, so there's no mystery that this building has an FAR of 10. Can they get 30 stories, 40 stories? No. The maximum in this case is seven stories or 20 stories, and that helps the community ex know what to expect when they go through the development review process. So if I may, can I, can I, can I ask, uh, do you find that in areas that have form-based code, do you find that it's more conducive to the development? How does, how does the development community respond to that? Developers want the rules to follow. You have two type of places. You have plan-making places and you have deal-making places. Most play developers don't want to work in a deal-making place. They want to know, give me the rules to follow and I'll follow them. That's the route that they prefer. There are some codes that have so many special use permits and so many categories, if you get to that point and every zoning you request is a conditional use, your code is broken. Your code is broken. It's not dealing with the market, so now we have to find, how do we get approval? I don't know. There's six special permits. What about conditional use? Here are the conditions. You know, I'm out. I, I, I'm, going, I'm going to rob the bush. This is too confusing. So predictability is the key in your rules. If you want to make it easier for something you want to see, make your rules easy to understand and to implement. So to answer your question, yes, a form-based code offers flexibility and predictability for the community, for council, and a developer. So that is why I find form-based codes very, very effective because you get the best of both worlds versus having a business team. You need consultants just to figure out how do we get this approved? That is not conducive to the process and it drives up the cost of housing, which makes it less affordable. Yeah, I, mean, I was just gonna say that's that's kind of what I was leading you into is that you know oftentimes we hear that uh, you know folks are gonna dread going through a rezoning and, and to spend a lot of money to go through a rezoning um, for it to potentially not happen and, and that often is can be the death knell for a lot of affordable housing projects um, that whether it's a for-profit developer or a non-profit developer that is a timely timely process a lot of effort and it may sour them on working jurisdiction just you know as you said put your hands up and it's just not worth the time so I think you have to, to be considerate of uh, what kind of housing do we want to get built and are we being amenable to that uh, within our code and um, you know I, I'm, I'm interested to see throughout this process if that's something that uh, the council and, and, and the city and, and residents consider I'm, I'm gonna ask these folks one more question but then um, We'll have your questions come in, so feel free to still write on three by five cards if you need. Yeah. And I'm passionate about this process. I apologize. I went through this. I'm very passionate, and I saw what happens at the end of the rainbow when you actually, as a community and as a council, get it right. So forgive me for my passion. I love what I do. What he means is, if we reform our zoning code, we will find pot of gold. <laughs> so. And when you get those pots of gold at the other end, people worry about displacement. You guys have, a couple of you have gone through this issue of uh, a refresh of cities and development. One of my favorite quotes is, everyone wants progress, no one wants change. How do you kindly talk to people who are seriously worried about any change going on in their city? Even in an old city like Richmond, where we get, like you said, James, generations come and go. Um, 
how do we how do we talk kindly to people about this? I mean, my, my approach is always to listen carefully and help, help to understand what uh, what can we get down to? Are there specific kinds of concerns that are perhaps addressable within the code, uh, or if they're not, can we talk through why uh, how the code already addresses that concern or or how an understanding of the real estate market, understanding of these other factors that come into play when real estate development happens can ameliorate the, the, the concern that might be presented. Jabbar, any thought? You're shaking your head like you don't want to try to top that. No, I mean, I think I'm usually, in, I'm, I'm not the planner of the group. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the oddball in the housing space that, that doesn't have a planning degree and, and uh, kind of doesn't work in planning. But I think kind of organization thinking more on the policy side, we're always looking at what other jurisdictions have done. And um, I have a colleague who's our policy director who came from Austin and they put in an anti-displacement bill. And the impetus behind that was we're expanding transportation considerably. We know that transportation is going to bring about a lot of development. Uh, and, and change in communities. How can we get in front of this through our zoning, uh, through other policies to ensure that where the transportation is expanding, you're gonna have incredible amounts of density that's allowed so that you can ensure that the kind of developments for which people who are gonna be using transportation every day uh, can take advantage of that. So just more so thinking um, ahead, and I think Richmond 300 does a good job of that, but it's just being cognizant of things like transit-oriented development and, and taking a look at where the, where the city is going and what policies uh, align with, with that direction. Yeah, I think we have to be wide-eyed to recognize that change is gonna come. Certain homes become obsolete, building codes change, and so we have to expect that neighborhoods over time are going to change. We always talk about what you wanna see for the future, but also what problem are you trying to solve? You're growing. There's going to be a demand for a different type of housing. So your role through the plan is to manage growth and change, and that every individual who owns property has a constitutional right to develop their property. Municipalities using that police power, they just determine what the rules are. So I think we have to take a step back and recognize change will be coming, but you have the power through the zoning code to articulate what are the rules and what will that development the form look like, the use look like, and just settle into that. It's hard to say I don't want anything to change. It's very hard if I own a piece of property and say I don't want you to change your investment. We just have to recognize with demands coming for new lifestyle choices, more mobility, more walkability, more choices that people can afford to live in Richmond, that change is coming. But through the plan, you manage that growth and change, and through the code, you set the rules. So you just have to find that middle ground of balancing it so you can allow the city to evolve and grow forward for the next generation that will call Richmond home both today and tomorrow. I just want to, specifically on the issue of displacement, it was a, was a deep and significant concern when we were doing our zoning ordinance in Charlottesville, particularly because the, the historically black neighborhoods in Charlottesville are also adjacent to the University of Virginia and downtown. So they sit on some of the most valuable land. And so there was a very real concern within the, within the community that as we allowed greater density in those neighborhoods, we'd see a teardown of existing homes and, and, and replacement with, with what we envisioned, small multifamily houses that were, that were uh, on the face uh, individually each unit less expensive than the current uh, scenario. We were already seeing teardowns uh, in that neighborhood. Of course, we were highest value land in the neighborhood, so that stuff was happening. So one of the things we did was we, we developed a set of code provisions that were focused on reducing the risk of displacement. And I stand by that those, those are of uh, significant value, and we significantly incentivized the production of affordable housing in those neighborhoods. But I think even more important are the things that we did outside of the code. So the city of Charlottesville made a commitment to invest $10 million a year as a floor, as a minimum, into affordable housing. That type of commitment for a community the size of Charlottesville is substantial. That's a larger commitment than many communities much larger than Charlottesville have made. 
We also target those go-out funds directly towards preservation of existing affordable housing. And when I say existing affordable housing, I'm talking about the quote-unquote naturally affordable housing. So for example, we recently learned that a mobile home park close to our downtown, uh, that there was a buyer for that park. And the city stepped in with partnering uh, nonprofit affordable housing developers in our community, and we purchased that mobile home park to both, uh, to ultimately preserve it temporarily as a mobile home park, but also for, for that land now to be converted over to uh, affordable housing in the future. And then we have a strong commitment towards resident-led planning processes. So we're engaging the residents of that park today into the planning process for what that affordable housing project will look like in the future. Many examples of where we've stepped in and purchased portfolios of, of lower-priced housing, particularly in neighborhoods close to our downtown and close to the university, so that outside of the zoning code, we are actively engaged in preserving affordable housing opportunities in the city. And let me just add, because Javon said it, and I agree with James 100%. I don't know the city has it. I'm not saying you should, but uh, I worked on one in Texas, also an anti-displacement strategy. We identified the vulnerable areas where we knew would be under development pressure. So as we contemplated, and it happened to be adjacent to downtown, and so we put a map and said, okay, here are the vulnerable properties. Let us figure out, in this particular case, we came up with a neighborhood conservation overlay district to preserve that community, which limited what could be developed there. But there are other tools, such as tax relief. And we're working with the county to figure out when development nearby goes up, their taxes doesn't go up because they didn't make any improvements. Same property, so I don't know what they're doing in Chicago, but they're becoming more and more prevalent, these anti-displacement strategies, because we know the local areas, and as zoning gets changed, and development pressure comes, they're allowed to stay. And so that's something I certainly support and explore because there's been a lot of trauma about lost generational wealth and a community who stays there and now they're being displaced and pushed out. So for uh, city officials that are in the room and, and, and folks kind of engaged in this, I think to this point, you know, a great tool that has been completed for our region um, multiple times and I know it's been working working on it to get refreshed is the market value analysis um, done by the reinvestment fund. They do that work across the country and they've done it for Richmond uh, twice now, but that really gives you an idea of where market forces are most prevalent, uh, where neighborhood change is, is most decisive and the impact that it's having on uh, different types of neighborhoods. And it's almost, and they have a displacement risk ratio actually, so that could be a way that you all could uh, develop your strategy around those neighborhoods and markets that have a great, the greatest displacement risk ratio. That's where you can really target some of the anti-displacement strategy. All right, we got people who want me to judge their questions. And the winner presumably gets dinner with the director of planning. <laughs> I, will, I will continue to make up what happens next. Thank you. Can you talk about? code refreshes that lead to more sustainable and, resi and are resilient to climate change. If we want to be more sustainable and resilient to climate change. Let's make sure, this is a tough question because that's primarily what the plan will do. Can you make recommendations in your code about stormwater, uh, could there be requirements in the building about providing bicycle storage facilities, which encourages people to bike more? There are things that you can do, so long as you understand what the code can do and what the code can't do. But certainly there are a lot of codes that are embedding sustainability uh, into their developments. And so I would say the answer is yes, so long as, and I'm sure the coding team knows what to do with, you know, here are the things you can put in your code to advance resiliency and sustainability, and then these other ones have to happen. I don't know if you have an office of sustainability or other policies, programs, and capital improvement. I would just make sure you allow the code to do what it can do and not overwhelm it and have it.
expectations of things it cannot do. But the answer is yes, you can embed things in your code to advance sustainability and all the other good things to help not only care for, but heal our planet. And I think one of the most important things we can do to address, I think, resilience and uh, the impacts of climate change is to develop in places that are already developed. Right? And develop in mixed use environments that, prom that promote walkability and those types of things. Um, and so, an important part, you can do all the things um, that were just described. You can, you can put uh, large apartments on, on these buildings, but it's also important to strike a balance, right? You don't want to go so far in the requirements that you impose that you make it not feasible to do the developments in the first place, and therefore you send the development out, back out into the squawk area, back out into the less desirable places from the perspective of sustainability. I've got several in here that um, already are overlapping. You guys, are, you guys have some great questions. Um, it's a there's a mixture of uh, very high level and then very tactical. We haven't had a super tactical one, so I'm going to ask this one first. Um, you mentioned floor area ratio earlier. Does it serve any useful purpose as a development standard? No. Agreed. <laughs> Shuffle faster. Um, Javon, here's one uh, that you, you touched on this earlier. Um, could you could you please talk about the Richmond Regional Housing Framework uh, and to what extent the framework is shaping the zoning code? Oh, good question. Um, so yes, our organization uh, put together the Regional Housing Framework about four years ago, really to serve as a as a strategy for area localities, the city, the right of Chester, the Hanover, the town of Ashland, um, and how they're coordinating on housing policy and housing solutions across many goals. So uh, multifamily, single family development, preservation, um, our aging housing stock, and seniors, in addition to uh, barriers to, to housing and things like you know, credit and evictions. So I think what really has evolved from that is understanding that each, each locality is working at their own speed. Uh, what the city's doing is not the same that what New Kent County is going to do, um, and, and vice versa. So we're really trying to work with each jurisdiction to figure out where they are in their housing journey, uh, getting to some of the basics, like having dedicated sources of revenue, and having uh, conversations like this around zoning, where in some jurisdictions they just haven't had that before. So thankfully with the city, much further ahead in that process, much more sophisticated in doing a lot more in terms of investments and then through this process with zoning. Um, so we work with the city quite a bit. We have uh, representatives on our board of directors as we do for all of our local jurisdictions. Um, and a big part of what we're doing now coming out of the framework is coming out with a, a regional policy agenda each year where we come out January our state of housing event and we say here's the regional priorities um, here's where the, not just local governments, but the corporate sector and philanthropy and everyone else who's interested in this has a vested stake in this um, can play a major role. And so I think that's really the role that we want to play is how can some of our largest employers and folks that are interested in economic development play a role in this space because it's, it's really necessary if we're going to make any kind of impact. It can't simply be uh, just local governments or just nonprofits. We have to have that foresight for-profit sector, corporate sector, from another vehicle. So I've seen my fair share, I'm sure a lot, based on the way people were responding to some of the questions earlier, I think many people in this room have been to American Planning Association meetings and Urban Land Institute meetings, and over the years, you will get an awful lot of presentations about mixed-use development equals ground floor retail with a couple of things above it. So here's a related question of that, based on what you all were talking about with flexibility. If you were advising us, Richmond, on ways to bake flexibility into our code so it can respond to the market, how would you advise us? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, working with the coding team, we came up with a very unique approach that had several mixed-use designation. Residential mixed-use, commercial mixed-use, industrial mixed-use, and that was it. Once they got the zoning, the developer determined what the market was at that time and built the building. And it was a mix. They determined the mix. 
You know, residential, we want it to be primarily residential, but it was a mix. Commercial, primarily commercial, but a mix, which include residential, include a hotel. And so that offered the flexibility by having these mixed use zones. Did we have residential, R1, R2? We sure did. But when it came to the corridors and growth centers, the developer chose, and we displayed, this is what residential mixed use is, this is what commercial mixed use is. Industrial mixed use, we were exploding with makers and artists that wanted a different kind of a space. It was up to the developer to determine what they wanted to do. And it worked. We have a lot of projects now since 2012, to 12 years now, that use all those categories, and they love it. They're not pigeonholed through a zoning case. You have to provide X amount, this much you know, transparency on the ground floor. You have to have a supermarket at 10 It's like, and then you can't make the deal work, and then the site stays vacant. Flexibility through these mixed use zones is a way to do it, and again, they come in different flavors. So it's like going to Ben & Jerry's, you have a flavor that works for you, you decide to go with another Ben & Jerry's flavor, because now that's what's trendy, you go with that. So I would encourage looking at those mixed use zones, offers a flexibility you need to not be pigeonholed, and based upon what the market is at that time. Anything to add for No. I 100% agree with, with what was said. I think the only thing we did in our mixed use zones that uh, is uh, builds on what was just described is we did identify those nodes where commercial was considered an essential component on the ground floor. And, and in those places, we didn't mandate the commercial use because that doesn't work. When you mandate the commercial use and the market isn't there, you end up with vacant space. But we did mandate that, it, that that space was commercial ready so that if, if the market wasn't there at the time the building came in and it's purely residential building, at least that ground floor could in the future be converted over to, to, to uh, commercial use. Um, so that means that the first floor height has a minimum height that's more of a commercial height rather than residential. Things like, things like that. Um, uh, flexibility is key and, and just remembering that many of these buildings, we hope that most of these buildings are gonna be around for 100 years and we do want them to be responsive to changing marketplaces in the future. Clarification, we did have certain requirements, I think at DX and other zones where you did have that certain mandatory on the ground floor, but still the flexibility is one that is helpful to make projects work. So you may have heard that Richmond is not a new city, so any project, any plan, any development proposal, uh, service or beneath the ground, is going to be a historic project of some kind. You're gonna have some group of people say, this is historic property, or this needs to be preserved for historical reasons. Is there a line, what is the line, how do you deal with that in old places? So we're, we're all, everybody up here um, is- to Clarify, is it historically designated as a site or building, or just the appearance has one of historical architectural integrity? Because let's go in reverse, in reverse order, the difficult one first. The difficult one is, this is a historic traffic signal. This is a historic building because it's 50 years old or 60 years old. It's the stuff that, that will grab a group of people to come out and say, we have to fight this because this thing feels old or looks old, it's historic. Put in your rules. Rather than have it abstract, I would put it in the rules and debate it. Uh, it's somewhat outside of zoning, because zoning is more focused on the building, on the site. I know you mentioned traffic light, but you have to codify it so that you as a community have to dictate what are the rules. If it is not an historic district, I would argue that the zoning should allow the building to be redeveloped. If you want to preserve it, then it has to be designated either historic district or historic district light, so that you're communicating, you can't develop this site. If you don't say it, and then someone comes in saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, we've changed our mind, this building is important, you have a mapping role, and you have a zoning and coding role, and you have to communicate to the public, to council, to the development community, what are the rules? What do you want to see, and what do you don't want to see? That has to be put out there in the rules, so that there's no uncertainty about what is important to you as a community. Make it predictable. I will say that uh, this is an issue that came up a lot in Charlottesville. Charlottesville also has been around for a minute. 
the one of the things we did do is we incentivized in our uh, formerly single family residential districts, we did incentivize the preservation of an existing house or an existing structure by allowing an additional unit above and beyond. So our, our lowest density district allows three units by right. If you preserve the existing structure, you can have a fourth unit by right. Um, I'm gonna blend two of these that are, that are related about density. Um, one is, please discuss the difference between density for density's sake um, and leveraging additional density to get developers to build other things. I mean, this, this particular part is going in the direction of housing, but I would add to it just other stuff that we're looking to get. Um, and then also, related to that, um, maybe this isn't a direct question, but more of a comment, what if we got away from the word density and were very specific about the metrics? Um, so instead of talking about in, in vague terms, we get into the specifics of types of trips that are generated, the potential for walking trips generated, for example, transit trips generated. So what's the differences between density for density's sake and for the plan? And then are there other ways to describe density other than the word itself? Yeah, I call it places for people. You have more of it, you have less of it. The word density does trigger because it is a scalable word in someone's imagination. Uh, but to me, it's places for people, whether living, playing, working, it's places for people. And is this more of it stacked or less of it not stacked? I think having a bonus is very effective if you want to quote unquote incentivize things to happen. You offer a bonus. Typically, it's used for affordable housing. Other cases, used for open space. And so, having a bonus, so long as you have objective criteria and not subjective criteria, you're telling again, we will give you additional places for people to live and work and play. If you, in exchange, offer this, you will get allowed to have more. So bonuses, I'm trying to avoid the words usually used, which is blank bonuses, are common practice and very helpful. And that is something, again, if you meet these standards, you get a couple of extra fours. And I think that's reasonable. But I would just say places for people to work, live, and play. That's what density is. Yeah, uh, bonuses are one of the most fundamental uh, components of inclusionary zoning programs in the way that you can incentivize uh, more units for people with certain incomes. So, but I will say that there is my jurisdiction if you have high restrictions um, in, in your city or county that are already pretty high, it might not make much sense. It might not be that great of an incentive for developers where if you're in an area that you can't build very high, then that bonus to, to build more units might be uh, worth the squeeze a little bit more. So, I think that's one component of it. And then density for the sake. I think just thinking about it from a development standpoint, it's expensive to build. There are acquisition costs, uh, those are very prohibitive to development. If you can get to scale with development, um, it just makes things a little bit easier. And so when you're thinking about why you don't see some lower density developments or more of your you know, traditional single family developments, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, from an economic standpoint, and we're certainly from an affordability standpoint, not going to get anywhere um, in cities, especially without prioritizing uh, density. And again, that can look a lot of different ways, but you have to get to scale in order to make it work for a lot of developers. So I can't fact check it. Well, I guess I could. The internet is up here next to me, but I'm not going to fact check this right now. I'm just going to read it anyway. Uh, given renters make up about 60% of Richmond City residents, how do we how do we get their voice in this process, which you know typically is going to be dominated by HOAs, where renters probably aren't at all the HOA meetings uh, or their their neighborhood meetings. So how do you, in your work, make sure that um, the people that actually live there are represented in the code? I don't want to burden staff, but. What we should do is we do pop-ups, and we're all over the place. We go to where people are, we set up pop-ups to engage people, uh, where we can legally go, uh, a special events where we'll have tables out there. So the thing is you have to go to where people are. Very often, most people will plan or listen to people who show up. We want to make sure we hear more voices, 
because this is a community for everyone. This is a city, I'm sure, of a few hundred thousand. And so you want to make sure you look at the demographics of the city by generation, by age, and you want to make sure, to the best of your ability, you go out there to hear some of those voices. If there's a community that's vulnerable, that may not be in tune with what's going on, you have no idea what people have in terms of child care needs, not being able to come to a meeting, you have to meet them where you are. And that takes extra work, but to me it pays itself, itself back in dividends by people being heard and it helps you understand their point of view, particularly some of the vulnerable areas that may be threatened for displacement. They may, may not know what's going on, we have to plan for everyone. So it does take extra legwork, but you have to meet people where they are. Shift into one that, uh, let's see, all right. And I'm proud of y'all coming out here for a zoning. That's, give yourselves a round of applause. Most people don't do that. Zoning is like, planning is the fun part. Zoning is like zoning. Rules, oh, that's fun. This is, um, I mean, a lot of these questions are gonna get at things that have been said on the stage uh, all night, but I think it's worth it's, it's worth asking these questions because they use different terms and different, they're coming from different points of view. Um, what, if you were gonna recommend a change or a couple of changes in particular to our code, knowing that we want to be a magnet, we want to be a livable place that everyone in the country is talking about, we want to be a business-friendly place that everyone's talking about, we want to be a, just a fantastic place. Um, what are some changes, I, I realize you guys haven't memorized our code, but what would you say, do this, make sure you do this, what is this? I started off, and I'll repeat it again, I know it's not the end, but make it easy what you want to see. When developers come in, they're your partners. A lot of people see developers as, the, it, you put out a blueprint, the city can't build it, you need partners to build it, here are the rules, help us build but then make it easy to do. Otherwise, what's the point? How are you gonna achieve your vision if you don't have partners? We talk about public-private partnerships. Well, that's what it is. And so to me, I think that's critically important. The other thing is I look to see how many special uses you have, how many exceptions. I mean, people get brain damage just trying to read the code that has patched worked over 50 years, and here's one case, let's do a code. So to me, make the code simple and easy to understand for yourselves, for the average citizen, and then make it easy to do what you want to see. If you want to have more housing choices, well then make it easy. In our code, we made it harder to do greenfield development out in the fringe of our city. And we made it easier to do development downtown where we want to see more diversity of housing, and guess what? It worked. We said it, we meant what we said it, and then we followed through. Do what you mean and mean what you say. That was our motto. Do what you mean and mean what you say, and we follow through. And so that's the advice that I would give you if you want to make a great city. Uh, the other equation I was talking about on the planning side is how do you build the three things most people don't think about to make your city exciting? How do you plan for fun, joy, and happiness in your city? How does that happen? Wait a minute. How does, that's right. How do you plan for that? And believe it or not, I don't like just using land uses. I talk about experiences. And through your code, how do you build those experiences, those mixed-use, vibrant places where people want to go to have fun, have joy, and happiness? To me, that's when you have a successful code. Just make sure it's easy to do and not hard. So it sounds like you're going to be teaching a class of it's the supply and demand of housing providers, food providers, and joy providers. I, I like this. I want to be writing this for you. James, what do you have? I was just going to say uh, focus on uh, ways to promote choice and opportunity. If you want to be a place where people are coming to, make it a place where they can see an opportunity for them to live, for them to open the business, for them to come and have fun. Be a place of choice and opportunity and build that into the code. All right, we, oh, go ahead. We, as we're just about to wrap up uh, for, um, before we do that. I, I know you just said what you did at the beginning, which is fine. Uh, I asked at the start, just briefly, what do you want somebody sitting out here to take away with them? What do you want them to take their, to tell their significant other or their kids or their uh, neighbor, or their dog walking friend, whatever? They talk to somebody who wasn't here tonight. 
What's one thing you want them to tell that friend? Zoning is cool. Come to future public meetings. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, oh, maybe we do need to. Uh, you be honest instead yeah. of what. <laughs> um, but, you know, as I said earlier, you need to have zoning that's complemented by the policy, that's complemented by the incentives uh, to really get at what we're talking about. If you, if you're, I mean, having diversity of housing and choice is great, but if we want to see lower cost, if we want to see greater opportunity for folks of all incomes, um, it won't come just by having more by rent or by smaller lot sizes. Um, you have to have that supported by incentives, supported by policies and funding that really target the folks that you're trying to create greater opportunity for. So, so we've, seen a, we've heard a lot of questions about uh, affordable housing, about addressing the impacts of climate change, impacts on the environment. If these are things that you care about, if these are things that you want to see uh, incorporated into the code, stay engaged. This is a long process. Uh, it's, you're easily looking at over a year. Uh, it's a political process. Uh, the code won't be adopted if people don't stay engaged, if they don't, if they don't uh, stay, continue to express what their desires are and uh, express their, their, what they want to see. But I'd also, this is not Richmond's final zoning code, right? Probably won't get everything in this code. But there will be a future, there will be amendments in the future, there will be other opportunities in the future. So, if you don't get it in this one, look for the future opportunity. Let's give our panelists a uh, round of applause. <laughs> and if you didn't get the question answered, they'll be here for four hours or five hours. Uh, so feel free, I'm gonna turn the mic back over real quick. Yeah, I just, uh, thank you once again for coming up this evening. James had said, you know, this is a continuing conversation. Um, even though, you know, we're not discussing, debating specific policy ideas about our code here tonight, um, you know, we really feel it's important to make sure that we, as a community, um, you know, are talking the same language, understanding, and, and elevating those conversations to uh, what they need to be. So, um, we'll continue to do this throughout the process, um, and if you have ideas for other things that you'd like to talk about, um, or individuals you'd like to see up on stage in terms of um, being able to ask some questions, um, please reach out to me and our team in the future. So uh, again, uh, thank you for coming out here tonight, and we'll see you.